Hello and welcome to an analysis of the White Album 2 light novel series. This is an analysis of Volume 1. So, if you've seen the rest of the videos, Volume 1 was a trip. Volume 1 is pretty much the introductory chapter minus the end. It goes all the way up to the concert. They're about to begin. The curtains rise and it ends. So, that's pretty much all we get to see. What I do like about volume one is that it goes way, way more into detail of Haruki's relationships with Setsuna and Kazusa individually than the game does. It gives us a lot of background information there. So let's see about the analysis written here. A Melody Spun by the Snow, part one. When one visits the beginning of a story after having extensively familiarized oneself with what happens later on, in the case of this series, with several possible futures, it is basically inevitable that one will spot the seeds of later story and character developments. Again, very true, especially written in the novels. They actually introduced Koharu super early on, which was really neat. White Album 2 makes very skillful use of foreshadowing, which means that small remarks and actions that might not register as much to a first-time reader can set off alarm bells for one with a larger viewing scope. If the wording here sounds dire, it comes in part from personal familiarity with forthcoming events, including the infidelity route arguably one of the harshest possible branches in the entirety of the story in particular. That said, we endeavor not to let the, that awareness rule the entire reading of this volume, as the seeds are still only seeds, and these are still teenagers, which means some level of irrational or unreasonable behavior or emotion is all but expected. This is what I try to keep in mind as well. They are still just, I don't want to say kids. They're not really kids. At this point, I believe all of them are 18 years old. But God, can you imagine an 18 year old having to deal with this much drama? Like, it makes sense. Setsuna's ridiculous, irrational fears of needing to be with her friends all the time and not being left out. It's, she's a teenager that got hurt. So that's very important to keep in mind. The volume sets up the bonds between the three main characters step by step from each of their three perspectives, and that thorough, well-rounded insight into what makes each of them tick is very valuable. One thing the novel does is take two characters who, on the surface, could hardly be more different from one another. Kazusa, the lone wolf, and Setsuna, the idol with the picture-perfect family, and draw broad but clear parallels between them. Each of them is shut off from those around her in some way. Each of them has trauma as a result of sudden abandonment. Ooh, that's very true. Kazusa from her mother and Setsuna from her friends. Each of them unexpectedly rediscovers an old part of herself through her association with Haruki. Though their respective ways of maneuvering through these issues and developments differ, a sort of balance is struck by the end of the volume, setting things up well for the story's continuation. Because now we have the backstory of the characters. Now we know who is involved, we know kind of what's going on with them, we know their pasts. And so now, from volume one forward, we can delve into the present and the future, and that's very exciting. Even if one sets Haruki's arcs with each of the girls together, there are parallels. He starts by barging in while the girl in question is exercising her respective musical ability. He expresses a wish to show her off to the rest of the school, to make everyone see how brilliant and talented she really is. And, upon discovering that he has indirectly caused her to suffer, he readily goes to extremes to make up for it. His dedication to the both of them, and to the cause of the light music club that they collectively make up, is earnest and apparent and unwavering. That being the case, it is hardly surprising that each of them develops her own sort of attachment to him in turn. 
And when they talk about him going to extremes, he literally said he would be by Setsuna's side forever until she got bored of him. How else are you supposed to interpret something like that? It's just... That was pretty far, in my opinion. <laughs> Setsuna's idol-like status in Hojo High School, born of her victory in Miss Hojo High contest her first year, puts her in an extremely stressful, tenuous position, aware at all times that the facade might break if she lets herself slip. As she confides in Haruki during their first karaoke date, she began working her secret job at a local grocery store in order to afford fancy new clothes for spending time with their friends, while said job cuts into her time for hanging out in the first place. Haven't we all had that happen? You work more at a new job to have money to do things, and then you're working so much you don't have time to go do things. <laughs> the karaoke, too, is a secret. No one at school would imagine their princess wearing herself out, singing alone, but she, because she can't stand having to share the mic with anyone else. Very greedy. But Haruki learns of this at once, from her own mouth, because she trusts him. Trust is a key word for Setsuna, especially when it comes to Haruki. He demonstrated already that he could be trusted when he didn't spread word of Setsuna's relatively mundane job around after recognizing her. And she already likes him enough to take the risk of trusting him with the full picture of her, the true Setsuna Ogiso. I mean, yeah, she trusts him in the beginning, and then immediately after, he's like, I'll never leave you. Then he forgets, he forgets to charge his phone and is gone for a day and a half, immediately goes back on his word, so. With that step, that trust, she learns to enjoy herself again, in a way that she never could on her own, casts aside her worries about keeping up her old facade, and makes up her mind to sing before a large audience for the first time. A genuine fondness begins to develop beyond appreciation. In session 11, as Haruki assures her that everything will work out, reminding her of how committed they all are to showing the school how well she can sing, she thinks to herself, I can do whatever I have to if it will make him smile at me. Setsuna's got it bad. She's got it bad for Haruki. That poor girl. As it turns out, there is another, more painful layer beneath her secrets, which Haruki doesn't learn until six days before their performance at the festival. Her sudden abandonment by the girls she thought were her best friends in middle school and the true reason she has so adamantly avoided getting any closer to any given person than necessary. The trauma of this experience has left her with a deep, almost visceral fear of being locked out of a group. And to make matters worse, Setsuna has fallen for Haruki, which is why her inadvertent discovery of Haruki and Kazusa's late night rehearsals causes such a horrendous shock to her system. I mean, yeah, any normal person who found that out would be angry about it or would be sad about it. But in Setsuna's case, it's her old traumas plus she has a crush on Haruki, which makes it twice as bad, if not more. It leaves her paralyzed with the fear that, sooner or later, Haruki will drop her. But when Haruki promises never to leave her, never to shut her out, never to let her feel that pain again, to stay with her until she gets sick of him and leaves on her own, she decides once more to trust him. A terrible decision, really, but here, here she goes. Even when his phone is dead in session 19 and she freezes up at the rehearsal for the show, she repeats that word to herself, trust, trust. She trusted him, she could trust him. That is a really big word for Setsuna now that they mention it. That's very true. This last scene does tie in with a darker component of Setsuna's attachment to Haruki, which manifests itself from time to time as a fixation on the relationship between him and Kazusa, occasionally verging on jealousy. No, I don't think occasionally. I think all the time she's jealous. A sense of rivalry between herself and Kazusa. 
She needles Haruki into admitting that Kazusa is beautiful in session 18, at the same time admitting that she's worried that things might have been happening between the two of them while they've been alone. This comes immediately after an expression of concern for Kazusa's apparent exhaustion, with a lament that she will continue spending time alone with Haruki, making it difficult to say that Kazusa's health is her priority in that instant. Oh, it absolutely isn't. And I feel bad for thinking that, but no, Satsuna, of course she's like, oh, I hope Kazusa gets better, but at the same time, she's not dying. She has a fever, and Satsuna knew that, so her priority in that moment was 100% Haruki. Haruki falling out of contact while taking care of Kazusa gives rise to two problem moments in this regard. First, a sudden vision Satsuna has of Kazusa lying prone, and of him at her side, taking care of her, while she panics on stage at the rehearsal, and second, her thought spiral as she heads in to get dressed for her class's exhibit at the festival. If Tomasan hadn't caught that cold, how would I be feeling right now? Would she be having fun, getting everything ready? Would she be laughing about how embarrassing it was wearing this outfit? What mood would she have been in, waiting for him to stop by as a customer? The latter leads to what seems the most pointed instant of this issue, when Haruki, having realized the magnitude of his error in letting his phone die, bursts in on Setsuna while she's changing to make his apology. <laughs> the most inopportune moment, Haruki always chooses the worst time. It is a simple few words because the first thing he had said, even before speaking of Kazusa's condition, had been an apology to her. Emphasis mine. <laughs> Those few words make it a comparison, and comparisons feed rivalries. And while this is true, I think it's important to keep in mind that every single time Haruki was talking to Setsuna. It was usually about Kazusa. He went on and on and on and on about Kazusa. And vice versa, whenever Haruki was talking to Kazusa, it was always about Setsuna. Setsuna this, Setsuna that. He has a habit of doing it. So in this case, for her to be pointing out that he was talking about her and to her before talking about Kazusa, I think it's a little more justified I mean, yeah, it's true that putting the sickness second is kind of a sad thing, but I think there's more to it than just the sickness. Similarly, at various points, she prods at Kazusa with her suggestions that Kazusa might have romantic feelings for Haruki, as though she were trying to force a confession. Setsuna has a tendency to apply pressure, whether she entirely means to or not. Kazusa characterizes it as a habit of making assumptions. Seen also in her insistence that she and Haruki begin calling each other by their first names. While this is a very concrete way from a story standpoint to show that two characters have grown closer, I mean, yeah, in Japanese culture it does show that they've grown closer, especially following Haruki's willingly standing out in the cold for two hours to talk to her, Haruki's narrations in that scene show that he is feeling a bit overwhelmed. He physically, her physically putting her own mittens onto his hands is another move that significantly ramps up the level of intimacy between them. And Haruki's definitely overwhelmed. I'm not saying that Setsuna's like forcing herself on him at this point because I don't believe that's true. I think these are all normal things for crushes to do. But Haruki never sets boundaries. That's his problem here. There have, there's never been boundaries. Occasionally he'll be like, Setsuna, that's so embarrassing. Or, I can't do that. But other than that, he never says no. And that's one of the biggest problems. The name point in particular stands out when one knows what a big deal names and terminology 
honorifics, second and third person pronouns, and so on are for Setsuna further along in the story of White Album 2. While Haruki may only have this nebulous feeling of pressure when faced with it, Takeya picks right up on it when he catches Haruki calling her Setsuna for the first time, pointing out that it's not the same nuance as his own Setsuna-chan, and that she wouldn't just suddenly decide to start calling him Haruki-kun for fun either. He can tell that something is in motion. And this is just a different of personalities because Takeya is the type of person to flirt with everyone. He's the type to try to get really, really close to everyone. So calling her Setsuna-chan, it's kind of like a teasing way of being like, I want to be close to you. It's kind of rude, but in high school, people are generally not that angry about it. But for Haruki, he's so diligent. He's kind of stuck up. He's an honors student. He would never call people for their fir- by their first names for fun. And so for him to do it, very, very different, very different meaning. In fact, Takeya's remarks upon Haruki's situation are the source of many of the more eerily prescient moments that first-time reader may not catch. Contributing in part to this is the fact that Takeya does not get his own point of view chapters. So anything he says to Haruki is filtered through Haruki's ears, his narrative voice, and therefore his commentary. Ooh, interesting. That's right. Takeya's riffing in session three, after Haruki's first karaoke night with Setsuna, jokingly accusing Haruki of stealing his technique and getting the jump on him, followed by his joke about the student surpassing the teacher or a proud father giving away his daughter as a bride, sets a humorous tone that is easily brushed off. His admonishment of Haruki for trying to start out with two at once, that is, to date both Setsuna and Kazusa when he's never dated anyone before, during their phone call later on is also pushed aside. And it's too bad it's pushed aside too because it's a very important moment. The sticky moment is near the end of that phone call when Haruki states that he needs Ogiso's singing and Toma's piano playing alike for the concert. Takeya responds, you realize what you just said was that you wanted to have both at once. In Japanese, he uses the word futamata, which most directly translates to two timing, but can also refer to sitting on the fence or trying to have something both ways. It's kind of like the, you want to have your cake and eat it too. Like, mm, you can't really have both. It's kind of like, usually people have to pick one or the other. Do you want to be a pro basketball player or do you want to be a nuclear scientist? Usually you have to choose one path. In this place, you have to choose one path. He's trying to take both paths at once, is kind of what it's saying here. And it's not working very well. Haruki takes this as yet another deliberate misinterpretation of his wording. But to a reader who knows exactly what happens when he does try to have both at once later on, there is something almost chilling about Takeya's question, like a warning. It is like a warning, and Takeya's not stupid. Takeya does this all the time. Takeya knows the warning signs and knows because he does it. So it is like a casual warning, even though it's just teasing at this point, he is serious. And later on, just as he notices the name change with Setsuna, he catches Haruki off guard by casually revealing that he could tell when Haruki was coming to school with Kazusa by how he deliberately walked three steps behind her. For all of Haruki's insistence that Takeya has the wrong picture of the situation, it seems as though Takeya might in fact be the more observant of the two when it comes to certain things. Which is a really interesting read because Haruki is like the super observant, super serious, honors student, studious, always paying attention, and yet he doesn't understand these simple things because Takeya's specialty is in relationships. 
especially relationships with girls. So he's noticing all these signs, whereas Haruki is so inexperienced in this way that he's not picking up on it at all. Haruki does have a certain distance when it comes to dealing with girls established early on by having his having been fully immune to Tomo Yanagihara when she brought the original light music club down in flames. At times, that distance might be more subjectively called cluelessness, particularly when he doesn't realize how his words sound. When he confesses about having lied to Setsuna in session four, she plainly believes he is about to confess to romantic feelings for her. Then, seems a bit put out that it didn't occur to him, which he interprets as being angry that he lied. Okay, but to be fair, the way the novel was written here, it was super, super misleading. Even to the reader, it's kind of a funny thing. Then, when he lets Kazusa know that he packed enough to potentially stay the night at her place again because you never know what might happen, the innuendo is completely lost on him until she blows up. It should be stated again, though, that cluelessness is subjective. At this early stage, he cannot necessarily be blamed for not picking through everything he says in advance, especially as he is dealing with two girls he has only just begun to get to know. And this is true. They're not deeply involved enough for him to have to be careful at those stages. He's just living his life with his two friends. But when things start getting more charged, when he's telling Setsuna, I will be with you until you're sick of me. I will be by your side. Things like that, like now you do have to start being careful. Things are getting serious. I just, uh, I don't know. He does also display a certain level of awareness at various points throughout the story when he notes that to an outsider, a given interaction, often with Setsuna, might seem romantically charged but he also fully believes that neither of said girls would ever develop a romantic interest in someone like him, which is part of his inner refutation against Takea's warning over the phone in session nine. Considering the apparent aura and caliber of the girls in question, this is understandable. And like we said earlier, we have to remember their age. Haruki is, I believe, 18 years old at this point. So yes, every single sign is here that both girls like him. They're like big flashing lights in his eyes and he doesn't see it. And this is typical of someone of that age. They don't pick up on those clues. They don't pick up on those signals, especially these dull, studious 18 year old guys. But looking at it from an older perspective, from an adult perspective, it seems so obvious. So we kind of have to grapple with the fact that a lot of the readers are more mature than Haruki. With Kazusa, it is particularly so. Her barbed remarks, shouting, huffing, drop kicking, and occasional violent piano playing would be enough to convince just about anyone that she hated them. And what's more, this thorny outer shell conceals an inner disconnect from her own emotions a refusal, or perhaps an inability to be any more emotionally honest or straightforward with herself than she is with other people. Again, very true, because Cousins is not even true to herself. So trying to get a read on her from an outside perspective, also difficult. If Setsuna's trouble point in a potential romantic development is anxious attachment, Kazusa's trouble point is outright refusal of any attempt to get near her. When she does finally allow herself to get truly vulnerable with Haruki in session 19, when she acknowledges to herself that she is afraid of waking up alone, insists upon moving her futon down into the studio while he practices, and ultimately tells him about her past, the feelings of abandonment her mother's sudden departure left her to grapple with, it is through the haze and weakness of a severe fever. And I think this is one of those points that we can kind of be grateful for. 
Because if she was of a sound mind, if she was of her normal mind, this probably wouldn't have happened. Or it would have taken way longer to happen. But because her mind was kind of clouded with this fever, it let her be true to herself in a way that she wouldn't have been otherwise. And when she asks Haruki whether he's going to start dating Setsuna after the show, it is hard to tell where the question is coming from, because unlike Setsuna, Kazusa has said nothing to indicate that she was pondering that angle between them. True. The only parts we know, the only reason we know Kazusa likes Haruki, other than like the little blushes and the little comments, is really because of seeing conversations between her and Setsuna, or seeing her own little monologues, her own comments. Nevertheless, she shows clear, promising signs of cracking through her shell in the course of the story, even if some of the barbs remain. Through her association with Haruki, Kazusa finds a motivation, an ability and readiness to exert a concerted effort towards an end that she had all but lost sight of in her apathy toward the world at large. Haruki makes note of it when he sees her scrawling furiously in her notebook in class, while she herself expresses surprise and satisfaction upon finishing her composition, asking herself aloud, how long has it been since I worked this hard on anything? This is such a good turning point for Kazusa though, because it's not someone doing something to her. It's not someone else changing her. She is working hard and she realizes her own motivation and I think that is beautiful. In fact, the setting of Haruki's lyrics to music is just one example, though the most empathetic concrete example in the volume of the way Kazusa shows her concern and budding affection for him through actions taken to make things work out for him. To put it in terms of the five love languages, words of affirmation, gifts, physical touch, quality time, and acts of service, Kazusa expresses herself best through the last of these, acts of service. The other act of service we saw earlier on is when she put the blanket over Haruki while he was sleeping. And this is something that you can do without having to express your emotions. You can do it without having to truly open yourself up. And I think that's why the acts of service would be easiest for Kazusa, because she doesn't have to be emotionally vulnerable. Even though she is, clearly, it doesn't show, which is good for her. She may be allergic, as Haruki puts it, to speaking in an honest way about how she feels, but her actions serve as clear enough demonstrations on their own that she is far from indifferent to Haruki. The sessions she plays with him, lasting for months before he even has any idea of who his neighbor is, are sort of a recurring sort of act of service as she guides his playing with her own, shifting her tempo or waiting as necessary for him to catch up. Her marching in that one summer afternoon to teach him how to play the guitar, though it was couched on her customary irritated griping and scolding, was unquestionably a service done for him, one she went uncharacteristically far out of her way to perform, and a precursor to their late night rehearsals together as the festival draws near. And this seems like something that was so small, like a one-day guitar lesson, but it's something Haruki would not shut up about. And when he was talking to Setsuna, and he went on that huge long rant about how great Kazusa is, that one-day lesson was very important for that. The chronically aloof Kazusa Toma finds it in herself to care about the success of the Light Music Club, about making Haruki's wish come true even if her feverish efforts to that end cross the line into reckless disregard for her own health. And again, big foreshadowing here, big scary foreshadowing. Do not do this kind of thing, this is so unhealthy. She's prepared to whip things into shape, almost literally, 
to drive Haruki until he perfects that guitar solo for Sound of Destiny. To pull together a third song with only 24 hours to spare for him. I love it. I love the acts of service thing. That is, that is such a beautiful analysis of this. A somewhat subtler example takes place at the beginning of that 24 hour rehearsal when Setsuna begins to react poorly to the third song having been kept a secret from her. Kazusa, knowing of Setsuna's complex around being left out of the loop, very deftly steps in and states that the secret was kept deliberately in order to surprise Setsuna, that it was Haruki's idea that, with the lyricist absolutely demanding that she keep it a secret, she had no choice. I don't like this. <laughs> I mean, nobody likes lying, but this is not good. Even if it was for Haruki's sake, this is not a good lie. You should have come out, you could come up with excuses toward the truth, like, oh, well, we didn't think we would get it in time, or I didn't actually tell Haruki I was working on it until yesterday, whatever the case was. But now they're sharing a secret, which is actually leaving Setsuna out of the group way worse than it would have been working on a song and leaving her out of the group. She recognizes the risk of Setsuna spiraling into doubt as a result of Haruki's actions again and prevents it, thereby ensuring things run smoothly once again so that Haruki's wish can be realized. This scene, the way that Kazusa bolsters Setsuna's state of mind with her words, is also an important show of her growing love for Setsuna as her friend. Mm. This is probably the only part of the analysis I'm going to disagree with so far. Because I don't feel like she was doing this to calm Setsuna down for Setsuna's sake. I feel like this was to calm Setsuna down for Haruki's sake only? Maybe that's just my own read on it. The two of them have spent a good deal of time together by this point. Kazusa helping Setsuna to polish her vocals as Haruki worked on his own. And in spite of Setsuna's teasing and hinting regarding Kazusa's own feelings for Haruki, it is clear that Haruki has come to care for her as well. Which I do agree with. I do think she cares for her as a friend, but that lie was, I don't think that was for her sake. In session 15, Kazusa picks up on the fact that all is not well with Setsuna, noticing not only that her singing is lacking its usual vibrancy, but even that she is less talkative than usual as they take their tea break. Her unintentional secrecy around her one-on-one -on -one rehearsals with Haruki had hurt Setsuna. And although she is taken aback by Setsuna's outburst, she feels guilty, whatever the circumstances might have been. Even though Kazusa doesn't say much, she doesn't put up her accustomed thorny front either. There is an emotional straightforwardness in this scene that is quite touching. I mean, yes, but I feel like Kazusa is so not used to having friends, she just didn't know how to handle that at all. And then the apology didn't even come until Setsuna was already gone. So while there was a teeny apology that Kazusa said aloud so we can tell like she does feel a little bad, did she feel bad for what she did, or did she just get upset that her friend was upset? You know, that's a big difference. And in spite of the bugbears that have been mentioned on each side, there are boons that both girls have gained from this relationship between the three of them. There is the experience, the thrill, the joy of working toward something together. The image of racing toward a shared goal is used numerous times which could never be found alone, and the understanding that it is a unique joy that requires others to share in it. And this is important too, because both girls, for reasons that they each have, are alone. And so for them to find a group to belong to, a group to work toward a goal with, is so important to both of them. They needed that in their lives. 
And along with that, there is a certain playfulness that begins to show in both Setsuna and Kazusa, which can only be achieved when one grows comfortable enough in one's surroundings. Setsuna's impish teasing of Haruki with her Mr. Student powder as a way of getting back at him for making her ride the train in her waitress outfit is very charming. And Kazusa later manages to taunt both Setsuna and Haruki by suggesting they force Setsuna to return to school in that same outfit. That is cute. That was one of the first times I think Kazusa really was poking fun at the both of them in a genuine way. And again, it was when she wasn't necessarily in a good state of mind. She hadn't slept at all the night before, which I think kind of lowered her guard and allowed her to kind of be herself and to kind of break that icy facade. So that's really nice. The intensive 24 hours they have just spent together have left all three of them in high spirits. Being able to work together is a big deal, but being able to laugh together is perhaps even bigger. Shared laughter is a sign not only of trust, but of compatibility, of chemistry, whether in friendship or in romance, which is part of what makes it so important that this big moment or series of moments has been shared between the three of them. That balance for now is maintained. Returning to the brief prologue after finishing the story, it seems evident that the wording was chosen in such a way as to keep the speaker ambiguous until the end of the introductory chapter. Falling in love for the first time, making a dear friend, finding a group to belong with, spending irreplaceable time together, wondering where it all went wrong. It foreshadows the strife that later occurs. <laughs> the strife, the foreshadowing. I like volume one because nothing terrible has happened. <laughs> While avoiding tipping the balance in favor of one girl or the other outright, thereby supporting the structure of the volume it prefaces. Still, even with that future strife in mind, even with that awareness, the note, so to speak, upon which the volume ends, is nonetheless promising in its image of the three friends on the cusp of the culmination of their diligent efforts and trials, both personal and interpersonal. So volume one, it really is. It just shows that buildup. It shows the history between the friends, all of it. It's just such a, such a good setup for the rest of the series. So thank you so much for being here on this analysis of volume one of the White Album 2 light novel series. And I'll be back to you with more content shortly. So until then, I hope you take care. See you.